Aloha, my name is Elaine Gallant, and I am your host of Books, Books, Books through Think Tech Hawaii. This is a show about reading books, writing books, and everything in between and beyond. Today's show is called The Spark and Sparkle of Elima Loomis. And why? Because Elima is a veteran journalist, veteran writer about science, your spark, medicine, another spark, and She's ventured into writing books and novels. So she's living on her imagination as a freelance writer. And that is one of the hardest things to do. Let me introduce you to Elima Loomis. Welcome, Elima. Aloha. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. Thanks, Elima. Good. How are you? Good. I'm fine. How long have you been a freelance writer? And how hard is it to make a living at that very job? Oh, that's a great question. That's a great question. Thanks for asking. Um, as you may know, I started my career as a staff writer with the Maui News. So I was on staff for many years, over a decade, um, with that and another publication. But I was freelancing a little bit on the side all along. So I was building up some experience writing for magazines at the time. And I, I just found that a great outlet for my writing, you know, to be able to write about things that weren't covered by um, the publications that I was employed by. Um, then I went freelance full time in 2014. And I have to say, it's been a great career. There's, um, you know, a lot of people have the impression of the starving freelancer. But um, I've been fortunate and I've also sought out, um, you know, niches to write about that, you know, I knew I would be able to make a living doing. Um, so that has made it uh, easier to make a path as a freelancer. Right. But you have to establish yourself, too, because I started out doing freelance writing as well, doing golf, travel and tennis and uh, ended up doing novels. But um, I, I gave up the freelance. I couldn't do it. I couldn't keep the steady uh, flow of income coming in. But you have managed it. You have managed. Tell us a little bit about your science writing and your medical writing. You've written for some very major companies. Sure. Yeah. And um, <clears throat> excuse me. You know, um, that's a really good point that you made, um, that it was more of a struggle to write about golf, travel and tennis, because those are really attractive subjects. And a lot of people want to write about those things. <clears throat> and there's a lot of people who, you know, have experience with travel and, and feel like they want to do that. So those tend to be very competitive fields. And consequently, it can be really hard to make a living writing about some of those more fun topics. Um, so when I knew I was going to make a pivot to freelancing full time and that I'd have to support myself and my family on the freelance income, I made a decision to move into some more um, uh, niche types of writing that I knew <clears throat> would be a little bit more lucrative and, um, you know, maybe more challenging, but maybe also a little bit less competitive in a way because there'd be fewer other writers trying to work in those areas. Right. Um, so, you know, it was kind of an accident that I ended up writing about science when I, when I first started freelancing full-time, I, um, pitched kind of a wide variety of stories. I, I was still writing for magazines at that time. And because there is such an interesting and vibrant um, science community in Hawaii, I ended up um, pitching a few stories about um, those topics and mm -hmm. was able to um, use those stories to get my foot in the door of different science publications. And so that's how I um, ventured into science writing. And I ended up you know, covering stories that were based in Hawaii, um, but also, you know, nationally, I was able to write about a wide variety of science topics, um, you know, through those initial um, clips that got me started. Um, then a few years ago, uh, you know, I made the decision, again, for financial reasons that it, it, as you know, it can be challenging to make a living writing for magazines now. Um, you know, there are still outlets where you can be paid well, but it's also a lot of work. It's very, very labor intensive. And um, as someone who's not just a writer, but also a parent, um, I wasn't able to invest the amount of time that it would take to do that job well and make a good living at it. So I made the decision to start writing 
um, content for organizations and use my science writing skills and start um, taking those to the private sector. And mm -hmm. um, so that enabled me to write content and write material that <clears throat> I like to describe as journalism adjacent. So I still write a lot of articles. I write a lot of blog posts. I'm still writing about science and in this case, medicine, I, I sort of shifted into medicine. Um, but instead of writing those articles for a magazine, I'm writing them for um, like a research hospital or, uh, you know, research institutions, universities and medical centers. Can you give us some examples of issues that are pertinent to Hawaii that you found most interesting and people didn't know about until you wrote about? I mean, I remember flying on Hawaiian Airlines one time and there I'm reading one of your articles that I think it was about Haleakala. Yeah, I did write about Haleakala quite a bit. Um, you know, obviously most people are aware of the telescopes in Hawaii. I wrote about um, astronomy quite a bit. I also wrote about the politics of telescopes in Hawaii. As you probably know, you know, it's an in, been an incredibly sensitive and culturally um, sensitive and challenging issue in Hawaii. And so I found that some of the um, science publications and science magazines on the mainland that I was writing for really were, were interested in having a reporter on the ground in Hawaii who was familiar with some of those issues and nuances and, you know, capable of, of reporting on those stories in a sensitive way. So um, I covered, you know, not just the research and the discoveries that were made by those telescopes, but also some of the controversy around the telescopes themselves. Um, I wrote about um, the volcanoes a lot when, you um, we had that big eruption a few years ago um, on the Big Island, um, on Hawaii Island. I covered that for um, an Earth Sciences magazine I was writing for at the time. And ocean science, of course, was a big topic that I covered um, quite frequently for different publications. Did you follow it, given the fact that Mauna, Mauna Kea, I mean, was it Mauna Kea or Mauna Loa? Mauna Kea, I guess, is uh, threatening to erupt again? You know, um, as you might know, I actually no longer live in Hawaii. I know. <laughs> I, I, for, for some family reasons, I ended up moving to Vancouver, Canada last year, which has been a big change for us. So um, I do still follow some of those, um, you know, science stories that are unfolding in Hawaii. It's obviously, it's very exciting, but I'm not quite on top of it like I used to be. So I, I wouldn't claim to be up to the minute um, on every new development in those stories. Right, right. Well, science was your spark and medicine was your spark, but your sparkle is in your books. Mm -hmm. And if we can show Elima's website, that would be wonderful because here's where you're gonna find all of her work about mm -hmm. her, her, her blog, you can sign up for that. Um, to follow all the topics that she's that she is writing about, mm -hmm. and also the books that you're writing. The first book you wrote was one that was is really fascinating. It was the Rough Riders. You want to talk about that briefly? Sure, I have it here, and um, it's a rare copy because it's. Oh, I think I'm yeah. blur. I blurred it. Yeah. Hold it right in front of your face, and then yeah, because yeah, you're blurred. Yeah, it's there a rare. Go. It's a rare copy because it's actually now out of print. <laughs> <laughs> but it was um <clears throat> it was a great opportunity it was my first book um you know one of the first little writing jobs I had out of college was doing oral history interviews for the Paniolo Hall of Fame and that was just a fabulous opportunity for me as a young writer because it gave me the chance to travel all around Hawaii and speak with some of um, our old timers and our wonderful Paniolo and the incredible stories they were able to share about um, their lives, you know, work as working cattlemen in Hawaii. Um, and then a few years later, after I had been working on that for a few years and um, had quite a few interviews to draw from, I was able to turn that into a book for Island Heritage. And um, that was just a really, it was just a joy to work on that book. And it's a wonderful book too, because it brings in the history, culture, it brings in the culture of Hawaii. And where does the word patiolo come from? Ooh, so um, now I have to say, it's been quite a while since I wrote this book, but um, <laughs> as, my, as I recall, um, that's actually, there's some dispute around the term paniolo and where it actually comes from. But 
Um, most people believe that it is a Hawaiianization of the word Hispaniola um, because the first um, cowboys who were brought to Hawaii to introduce ranching and cowboy techniques um, to the islands were um, Spanish from what was Mexico at the time, now California. And so I, I, as I recall, it's believed that the word came from the word for Spanish. Yes. Okay, I can see the transition easily from science and medicine to writing about the Paniola, but then you wrote. I, I should go. I should go back. Actually, sorry to correct you, but but actually, science and medicine is a recent um, niche for me, and so this was my first. This is my first job out of college, so this is sort of where I started from, and um, then I, I moved into the science later in my career. Okay, but then you wrote a children's book, Come Amy's first roundup. Again, it has to do with the, uh, the, the, you know, the rounding up of, I think it was horses, right? Yeah. Um, was also. Cattle. Yeah. So as you probably um, remember, yes, here it is. And yeah. um, oh, where is it? It's blurred again. That's all right. We can show it on your website. As there. you probably, as you probably remember from um, your experience as a freelance writer, uh, every writer loves to look for ways to repurpose their material. Um, so after I finished writing um, Rough Riders and had all these wonderful um, Paniolo's stories, um, I thought, well, what else can I do with all this material? I spent re you know years researching and um, you know, you never want to leave anything on the table. So I I looked at Island Heritage's lineup and um, saw that they did children's books and that they didn't have anything about any children's books about Paniolo. And I thought it would just be a natural subject to write about for kids. Uh -huh. um, so, you know, I didn't set out thinking that I wanted to be a children's author. It was, you know, simply a mercenary decision to to try to get the most. <laughs> Uh, mileage out of my research as possible. Yes. But after I wrote the book, um, I just absolutely loved the experience. It was so much fun. Um, you know, I loved, um, you know, of course, being able to share it with kids. But I have to say that as a writer, I really loved the challenge of writing for kids. You know, it's hard, as you probably know, to take a complicated subject. And I, I find it much more challenging to um boil something down and make it as simple and easy to understand as possible than it is to, you know, go on and on and include all the details. So I love the challenge and it made me want to write more for kids. Wonderful. And then next came the Eclipse Chaser, not the Eclipse, but Eclipse Chaser. And yes. that's where the science and writing novels came in. So right. I so actually I yeah, um I have to just correct you briefly. I I am not a novelist. I don't I don't write novels. I'm like st strictly a nonfiction writer. Um so this was actually much where is it there? This is actually um much later in my career, maybe about uh maybe 10 years elapsed between um when I wrote my first books and when I wrote Eclipse Chaser. Um, but by the time I was thinking about that, I had moved on. Um, I was now freelancing full time. I was science writing full time. And um, I was interested in writing more books. I, by then I had a literary agent and um, was talking with her about different ideas. And she had worked with this series before called Scientists in the Field, which is a wonderful series. And at the time it was published by Houghton Mifflin. And I think it there might've been some kind of sale in the publishing world that I think it might be now with a different publisher, but um, she had sold to them before and suggested that I find a topic for that. And once again, I looked at some of the fabulous science that's being done um, right back in Hawaii. Um, and by then I had, um, you know, done quite a few stories for, um, you know, science publications about the Institute for Astronomy and some of the researchers there. And someone suggested um, a wonderful scientist named um, Shadia Habal. And I have uh -huh. to find a picture of her. Sorry, I should have had this prepared, ready to go. But um, Shadia is a, um, here she is, if you can see her. 
Yeah, Shadia is a, um, well, we can't see her, but that's okay. Yeah, there she is. Uh, there. Just brief, pop, pops in and out. Yes, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> She's, um, she is uh, a solar physicist and she uses total solar eclipses to study the sun's corona and uh, which is a, the sun's atmosphere, which is a pretty interesting and mysterious and important part of the sun. And by traveling around the world, chasing solar eclipses, she's able to get sort of a once in a lifetime view of this very special mm -hmm. um, part of the sun's atmosphere. And um, so I, I reached out to her and I had written a couple articles about her already, I believe at the time. And so she was willing to let me tag along uh, with her on the 2017 total, total solar eclipse, which um, she happened to be going to Oregon um, to observe. And so I just had an incredible opportunity to travel with her um, to that, to watch her and her team in action. And um, maybe the most fun for me, I got to um, team up again with Amanda Cowan, who was a longtime photographer at the Maui News. We had collaborated as uh, reporters for many, many years, and and she was able to um, come with me to shoot the book, and uh, we had a couple of days in the field together, so that was a lot of fun. That's wonderful, and you'll have to excuse me for calling books and novels. That, to me, they're you know I know they're not the same. I do know the difference, but yeah, I get excited about anything <laughs> that between the covers of anything that is a, a novel, a book, or or you know just a story. I just love it. Love it all. Well, I have I have so much respect for novelists because, um, you know, as a nonfiction writer, I, I I don't think I have the imagination to make up worlds. I can only write about the world that we have. Yes. Well, <laughs> so I, I have so much respect for novel fiction <laughs> novelists. Yeah. Obviously, you do have the imagination because your next one is Ohana Means Family. Yeah. And that is an adorable. That's an adorable book. You know, um, I think it was mentioned that it's, it's, it, it goes along the lines of the house that Jack built. And I have to agree with that. Um, but what, what makes it wonderful is that it's easy to understand. It's easy to, it's, it's rhyming. It's, you know, it's just, I think you did a really good job with a very short piece. And then, the, of course, the end of the book where we have the commentary. Um, excellent. Just adorable. Yeah. Thank you so much. It was really a joy um, to write, you know, as, as you mentioned, you know, it's not <clears throat> entirely made up because it's, um, you know, based uh, in um, Hawaii and, um, you know, a, a very traditional, Ready? you know, traditional Hawaii, Hawaii food. Um, and, you know, my experience growing up in Hawaii and eating poi um, but it was really a delight for me as a writer to use a more creative part of my brain and write something that's a little more lyrical and poetic. And as you mentioned, it's for much younger children. So, um, you know, my, my book Eclipse Chaser is really more for a middle school age child. And I had a little space to, um, ex you know, to, to explain a bit more about um, the physics of, you know, solar eclipses and, and things like that. But for Ohana Means Family, it's really for a much younger child. And I think it's only about 250 words in all. So um, it's, a, it's a very different kind of challenge to write something like that. Yes, but the illustrations that go along with it are very good. Do you want to talk about the illustrator at all? Yes. Um, you know, as you might know, if you've ever done anything in children's publishing, um, as the author, you have no control whatsoever about uh, the illustrations. So, you know, the first time I saw them was a couple of years after um, the book had been sold. And, um, you know, you just kind of send your words off into the world and you don't know what you're going to get back. And so the, the publisher finally came back to me a couple of years later and, um, uh, they had hired Kennard Pak, who's a, I think he's a quite acclaimed award-winning illustrator. And so of course I was thrilled that he was being paired with the book. And, um, you know, I, I saw the, the illustrations only after they were all completed and, and he did send them to me. And, and I asked um, Hukuao Pellegrino, who provided some cultural expertise on the book to take a look at them as well, make sure there were, you know, nothing that needed to be corrected. Um, but it was a, 
complete surprise to me as well. And so I, I was just delighted to see what a beautiful job he did with the illustration. Yes. Cautious when you're writing about Hawaii. Are you like, very <laughs> cautious about making sure you use the right terminologies and you represent well and because um, I know I, I I'm very cautious when I write any story about Hawaii and I write yeah. fiction that's a that, that's a little trickier I think Maybe. <laughs> yeah of course it's it's so important you know and, and like I mentioned I really um, was so grateful to have um, Hukuau Pellegrino who is a um, language expert and a cultural expert to you know really make sure that um the story was correct and appropriate. But yes, I think that's very important. Yes, we want to represent correctly. Uh, what topic most excites you, Lima? You've gone, you, I mean, you have. You now have a, a nice rainbow of, of, of topics under your belt. You've got experiences, you've got um, knowledge in, in various camps. What most excites you? Oh my goodness, that's such an interesting question. You know, over my career, um, one thing I'm really grateful for is how much variety I've been able to cover. And so, you know, the things that are interesting me today or, or most exciting for me to write about might be completely different tomorrow. Um, you know, at the moment, I'm working on another children's book about pollinator gardens. And um, it's really made me excited, um, first of all, about pollinators. <laughs> and, um, but, you know, secondly, uh, it's really, what's really resonating for me is the theme of um, how individuals and communities can make a difference by working together. And, you know, I was really surprised to learn when I was researching this book, that even though, you know, as, as most people know, bees and other important pollinators are really threatened, and some of them are, are endangered and very threatened species, and they're so important for our ecosystem. But I was really surprised to learn that actually you're able to make a pretty big difference just with a very small garden or, you know, cities are actually at the forefront of conservation for some of these species because they are such small creatures. You don't need acres and acres, um, you know, hundreds of acres of conservation land to protect these species. Sometimes something as small as a, a rooftop garden or a city park is enough to provide them with the habitat they need. Mm -hmm. So um, I was really inspired by that. And it, it sort of has gotten me excited to think about other ways that individuals um, can make a difference in their community and in the world. Mm, I understand that. My, uh, me and my friends are all into monarch butterflies right now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, and it's so important to, pre to preserve them. And, you know, and yeah. one of the best ways to do that is by planting food and habitat for them. Yes. What's in your future, Lima? Where are you headed? What, what's, what's on your horizon? Oh my goodness. Um, you know, I would love to write more children's books. It's um it's something that I find really exciting, you know, especially as someone who, you know, uses that analytical part of my brain um a lot during the day when I'm um, you know, writing for hospitals and writing about research and things like that. I really enjoy the time I get to spend on more creative projects and um writing for children. Is really exciting because as I mentioned earlier it's it's such a creative challenge for me as a writer to um, you know try to make something that's understandable and interesting and exciting for kids to read so I would love to continue working on that you know as I mentioned um, the the project I'm working on at the moment happens to be about uh, bees and pollinators but um, I have no idea what the future could <laughs> could have in store for for that yes well you're, you're in an interesting place now in Vancouver so uh it'll be interesting to see what you come up with yeah you know and so I have lots of friends here in Hawaii so we hope you'll stay in touch with us here Ilima what's on your nightstand what are you reading oh my gosh um okay well I I wish I brought it up for show and tell <laughs> um I'm an avid reader I um I'm always reading for, for pleasure, I read a lot of fiction novels. And at the moment I'm reading a novel called um, The Likeness by Tana French. And oh, I, it's love a, I love her and it's a mystery set in Ireland and there's kind of a cool spooky twist to it. So um, I've really been enjoying that. So I think the fall weather has, has made me wanna get cozy with some good mystery novels. Her writing is fantastic. Tana French's writing is just fantastic. She she oh, yeah. actually 
someone who we study as writers. But um, have you heard of Mary Roach? She's a scientific writer. Of course. I love Mary Roach. <laughs> I've read all her books. I love her, I love her yeah. books too. All right. Elima, thank you very much for joining us. I wish you much success with everything that you write, from your science and your medicine to your children's uh, work and your and a- anything that you do, because you are a delightful writer as well. And you have you do take a complicated subject and you bring it down to not down, but you 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 break it down so that it's understandable and educational and entertaining all at the same time. And it's why I wanted you on the show. I think you are full of spark and sparkle. I- I'm so happy to have you. Thank you for joining us. I would like to thank the studio, all of the staff, Jay Fidel, and especially the underwriters. We so appreciate you supporting Think Tech Hawaii. And of course, the viewers, thank you for joining us. My name is Elaine Gallant. This is Books, Books, Books. Good night. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.